extend to you the grace, mercy, and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning on the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Our text for today's message is from the gospel. Please join me now in a word of prayer. Father, we really fully never understand your ways and your thoughts. You are so far above us. Even in these parables that you try to explain things to us of heavenly things in earthly language, we sometimes just don't really grasp it all. But oh Lord, help us just to marvel in the mystery of your being and in the mystery of your knowledge. Help us to give you praise and thanksgiving for all that you have bestowed upon us and even for your greatness above us. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Friends in Christ, the last two parables, today's and this one, seems to cause a lot of questions which parishioners ask their pastors to resolve. Questions that even pastors can't even really fully answer, no matter how many years of study they go through. Last week we talked about, like, the parable of the good sower may bring up questions of predestination, brings up questions of God's favoritism, this one brings up the question of a $12 word that theologians like to toss around called theodicy, which is the justice of God. Trying to figure out if a God is all powerful and almighty, why does he allow terrors in the wheat field? How do you answer that question? That's called questions of theodicy, questions really have no answer on this side of time. We see in this parable today that Jesus once again uses a common day experience to explain spiritual truths which are way above our comprehension. In this parable, Jesus uses an example of how a farmer will go out and sow some seeds. And over the course of time, lo and behold, you think you have thrown in good seed, but here comes up some tares. And you wonder where they all come from, because you thought you threw down good seed. And in the parable, the sower tells the attendants, whoever they may be, to let them grow together until the professional reapers come along. Because the attendants are going to not get it right. We've got to leave this to the pros on the last day. Jesus then goes on to explain this parable that he is the sower. Unlike the sower of the seed in the parable, anyone who casts God's word out is the sower of the seed. But in this parable, Jesus makes it very clear he is the son of man. The seeds are not the word of God in this parable. Jesus explains it very clearly. The seeds are the sons of righteousness. You and me, others who come to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through his word and sacrament. The professional reapers, Jesus says, are the angels who are coming on the last day and are going to be able to separate the wheat from the tares without making a mistake. But the attendants, he never identifies in this parable. Who are these attendants? They can't be the sons of righteousness because in the parable they're two distinct characters. Who are these attendants? And when you get down to that question of this parable of the wheats and tares, you start raising some questions of theodicy where why are these attendants so incompetent? How in the world did they not figure out what we do in our world today called shift work? Right? Somebody could have slept while somebody was watching. They didn't figure that out. Who's at fault? Is it the attendants? Or maybe we want to do what President Truman so honorably did with his desk, where he put that little plaque saying the buck stops here. Do we want to take it all the way back to God? and ask him why he hired such incompetent attendants? 
There again, questions of theodicy. Did God fall asleep on the job? Could God not have done better? Why does he allow these tares to be among the good wheat? We see in Psalm 121 that God doesn't fall asleep on the job. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. How in the world or why in the world does he allow the tares? Who creates so much problems for the wheat as we work through this world and this journey called life? Why the tares? And you can debate that question forever, not coming to any convincing conclusion of why these tares are here. It's one that just befoggles the mind. But it leads to other questions. It leads to other questions that are asked in the parable. All right, so the tares are here. They're a reality. Why don't we just go out and pull them out? Well, if you look at the next slide, you can see why Jesus says what he says. Can you see the difference very well between a wheat and a tear? How close they are? The attendants aren't going to get this right. Jesus says, no, let the wheat and the tares grow together until the last day because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to end up uprooting some of the good wheat with the tares in your journey to make the perfect field. Let the professional reapers do the job. See, back in those days, in that common day experience of Christ, they couldn't figure this out. The tares and the wheat looked so much alike until they started blossoming, and then even at the time they became blossomed, they were so enmeshed around the wheat, it was impossible to really do the job. I understand now technology can get this done. That they can actually separate tares from wheat, which was not something they could do back in the time Jesus told this parable. The tares were there, and Jesus said they're sown by the enemy because you guys fell asleep, and because you can't tell the difference, we're going to let them stay until the last day. And I know that over the course of time, the church is always trying to be the weed puller. Right? If you look in church history, it's not a spotless history. During the time of King Henry VIII, I don't know how many people he accused of being a heretic and burning them at the stake. Quite a few. And then I think we're all familiar with this Spanish Inquisition. Again, these were attempts to get rid of the tares. And a good guy, a wheat stock, was mistaken for a tare years before Martin Luther. His name was John Huss. They burned him at the stake. Later on, his theology was found to be resurrected in the man called Martin Luther. And if the church would have had his, their way at that time, he too would have been burned at the stake. You see, we're not experts in determining the difference between a wheat and a tear. Let them both grow at the same time. Let the professionals come and do this separation on the last day. We think we're experts. We think we're experts since the fall into sin. Remember the temptation that Satan gave to Eve that when you eat of this knowledge of good and evil, you will know both good and evil? And we found out, really, even after we've been promised this knowledge, we don't have it. Sometimes we call the evil good, and sometimes we call the good evil. We're not experts on this good and evil thing. Let the tares grow with the wheat until the last day. Let the professional reapers take care of it. Another question then that pops up is, okay, if these tares are going to be here with us to the last day, then how do we get protected from their evil influence? How do I protect myself and my children, my family, from the influence of these evil tares who seek to destroy us and destroy our faith? What can I do? Scripture is very clear. One way to get protection from having the tares overtake you is to be embedded in the means of grace. 
the word and sacrament, to make this a priority in your life and find nutrition here where God strengthens you in ability to stay faithful as wheat. Because the tear, according to what a Greek botanist used to say, wheat amidst tares can sometimes cause the wheat to turn into a tear. To stay a faithful wheat, stay embedded. And then do your best you can against all these influences, the tares, when you see them. Because again, the tares look so much like the wheat in the innocent stage until it's later produced. I, I just had an example of this this past weekend. And I had to catch myself because I was falling into this trap. I had the grandchildren up here this weekend. Uh, Things were really chaotic yesterday morning with the two granddaughters. One didn't sleep the night before. The other one slept okay, but she was going all over the place as a 14, 16-month-old baby. Nobody could watch her. She was running back and forth, and I just ran out of breath. And I thought, man, you know what? I'm going to do what I did with our two kids, Micah and Seth. I'm going to put them in front of Barney. And I'll never forget what Dad told me about Barney. When he saw my kids watching Barney, he was such an anti-evolutionary type of guy. He, first time he exposed to Barney was wa there watching them with Micah and Seth. He says, oh, great. Now we got a purple dinosaur teaching our children about evolution. And I said, Dad, it's not, not there. But as I watched McKinley settle down to watch some Barney yesterday morning just to give me some peace and quiet, I thought about it. You know, people have always warned me to make sure you don't let the television be your babysitter. And you may argue, well, you know, Barney, he's, he's an innocent character. He's going to teach ABCs. What can go wrong with having your kid learn ABCs and numbers and colors from a purple dinosaur? What could go wrong? It's, it, that's not the point. But what's the point is, as I was watching McKinley and I evaluate myself on what I did yesterday, I began to come to this conclusion. I was conditioning this child to let the TV be her teacher. Get it? And so if we continue to allow the TV to be our child's teacher, what's going to happen when that child turns 14, 15 and starts watching other things on television, which we disagree with, but we've already told them the teacher is the television and no longer us? It's going to be a hard battle. Those tears are tough out there. Stay embedded in the Word and Sacrament. Try to do the best you can to discern the tear. Don't pull it because you may be wrong. But stay away from that influence because of the danger it may bring. So the final third question you can ask about this wheat and tear thing is, all right, can anything good come from this? Can anything good come from having the tares be raised along with the wheat? I think there was a guy that kind of asked that question. His name was Nathaniel. In the next slide, uh, in John chapter 1, Philip, he finds Jesus and believes Jesus to be the Messiah. And he runs over to Nathanael and says, hey, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael says, now, wait a minute. I know my Old Testament, and there's nothing in the Bible that says the Messiah is coming from Nazareth. And I don't think anything in the Bible says any prophet's going to come from Nazareth. So he asks the question, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? You see, Nathaniel thought Nazareth was a tear. It was actually a wheat stalk. Something good can come out of Nazareth. Jesus did. And then think about this. Would you think anything could come out of a garbage dump? Do you think any good could come out of a place where they execute the most vile criminals? Any good come out of that? Could you think any good could come out of man's intent to kill God? Whoa. Now we're getting somewhere, right? Isn't that what happened on Golgotha? Golgotha was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. Golgotha was where the place they executed the criminals. And what came out of the most vilest dump 
was our salvation. Good comes out of evil tares. Hmm. And so when these tares are around us and they bombard us, Peter has this to tell us in the next slide. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, various tares in your world. So the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by the fire of tares, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the end, God has used the presence of tares to strengthen his church. Over the course of time, because of the presence of tares in the wheat field of God, the church has grown and spiritual giants have been raised. It's amazing how the tares affect the church, affect the wheat field of Christ, but in a good way. Tertullian had this to say. In the next slide, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. This was in the early church period, 100, 200 A.D., that no matter how many Christians were being thrown to the lion's den, how many Christians were being martyred to death, the church kept growing. The tares around the church were making the church productive. God can make good come from evil. All the tares in your life and even the devil himself, get this, must serve the purpose of God. Everything must work to God's plan. Good can come out of evil. The cross of Calvary tells us so. In his name, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For the words of our message, we can bring forth.